Thank you very much indeed, Mark, for those very kind words. Um, I'm delighted to be here, and I should like to thank the College for doing me the honour of inviting me. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, particularly at this time of year when it's so miserable in England. Um, does everyone have a, uh, a handout? Um, it, good. I mean, it's really just a... Um, a brief summary, which I thought would be, would be useful, with some, some quotations there, too. <coughs> Can philosophy really offer advice on happiness? <coughs> Certainly, this was one of its grand traditional aspirations. In the 17th century, it was taken for granted that the philosopher's job included talking about how to achieve a happy life. When the great French thinker René Descartes was a schoolboy, one of the state-of-the-art textbooks he studied was a massive compendium of philosophy in four parts by the now-forgotten scholastic philosopher Eustatius. It discussed logic and metaphysics and physics and psychology, but it also stated that the, quote, the final goal of a complete philosophical system is human happiness. Um, and that was following a long tradition that stretched back through the Middle Ages and indeed right back to classical times. The Roman Stoic philosopher Seneca wrote a treatise called De Vita Beata, on the happy life. And much earlier, his Greek Stoic predecessors had offered many recommendations on how to live a tranquil and calm and balanced life, how to achieve a good flow of life, as the um, Zeno, the founder of Stoicism, put it. Um, that's in the third century before Christ. And going back a little earlier to Aristotle, generally reckoned rightly to be the founder of Western philosophy along with Plato, um, Aristotle gave lectures on eudaimonia, um, which may be translated happiness or fulfillment. So, it's a project with a long history, and you might think um, an important project for philosophers. Um, but by the middle of the 20th century, and um, Mark Nelson alluded to this in his introductory remarks, um, something went wrong. There was a kind of loss of confidence um, I think it's an interesting sociological question exactly why that happened. I think the, the causes perhaps are not just philosophical. But philosophers at any rate lost faith in the whole idea of goodness and value as an objective domain that could be properly investigated by human reason. Um, the logical positivists whose shadow though it was fading, but the shadow was still there lurking over the philosophical scene when I was an undergraduate. Um, they thought that all talk about ethics and moral philosophy was pretty much meaningless. And they tended to say that ethical pronouncement were just e pronouncements were just expressions of purely subjective preference, uh, mere value judgments. In those days, we were taught to say, oh, that's just a value judgment, meaning, oh, that's just your personal taste or your opinion. Um, and alongside that loss of faith in objective value went a loss of faith in philosophy's traditional role as involved in the quest for the good life. Instead of giving us answers to grand questions about happiness and the meaning of life, Students were taught in the 1960s and 70s that philosophy had a much more modest role. It would merely help us to clarify the meanings of terms. It could maybe tell you what was meant by the word happiness, but it couldn't tell you about happiness. Um, indeed, the typical view was that Anything, any question about the meaning of life wasn't really a proper question at all. If you want to know about the meaning of life, you've come to the wrong department, students used to be told. Um, and indeed, 
the view was that this wasn't a subject for any department, really, because to talk about the meaning of life, it was often said then, was a meaningless project. Maybe a sentence had a meaning or a word had a meaning, but life didn't have a meaning any more than a tree or a rock has a meaning. Well, I'm glad to say this rather dreary and restrictive view of philosophy has been rapidly unraveling in more recent years. Um, indeed, since I published a book on the meaning of life in 2003, um, three or four other, but rather irritatingly from the point of view of my royalties, um, rather ir three or four other books with the same title have appeared. And in the last two or three years, uh, in Europe and North America, there have been quite a few conferences and uh, uh, symposia on the meaning of life and happiness. So these big traditional questions are back. And what is more, uh, this subjectivism about value has gone right out of fashion. And perhaps to everyone's surprise, ethical objectivism has come right back into the picture among professional philosophers. Uh, many, I think most work philosophers working now in the Anglophone philosophical community think there are right answers to questions about value and right conduct. They may be very hard to discover, uh, but I think, uh, but of course that's true of science, scientific questions, they're very hard to find the answer, but most people believe there are right answers. Um, and I think the majority of philosophers now think there are, in principle, objective questions um, about value and meaning, not, uh, which can, in principle, be answered, and that these are not just matters of personal taste. Well, this new philosophical confidence, this ethical uh, objectivism, uh, I think quite exciting uh, developments in the subject. And when you think about it, they make a lot of sense. We are, after all, as Aristotle famously pointed out, animals, albeit animals of a rather special sort with the characteristic of rationality. And if you just think about animals for a moment, whether an animal is happy or flourishing is it, a perfectly objective issue. It's, you can just see that a horse or a dog or a cat with a glossy coat, well-fed, not uh, exploited or bullied, uh, not overweight or diseased, but enthusiastically getting on with the activities characteristic of its kind, the equine or canine or feline activities, that you can just see that it's flourishing, happy, thriving, a prime specimen of its species. And common sense here is backed up by science, since there are all sorts of psychological, biochemical, and physiological indicators of well-being, which can be established quite objectively. So, um, by analogy, perhaps, we might expect that humans who are flourishing and happy could similarly be identified quite straightforwardly. But, of course, in the case of humans, it's not quite so simple. We are certainly biological creatures, so it's reasonable to think the basic preconditions for our happiness will include elements we share with other creatures. To be happy, we need to be well-nourished, healthy, free from external repression or exploitation, and able to develop our human capacities in ways that allow them to flourish. If you look on the handout, we're, we're now on 2A. Um, and uh, Sir Anthony Kenny, um, a, a very well-known philosopher with an extremely wide range, particularly in the history of philosophy, who was actually my supervi uh, supervisor for the doctorate a long time ago, um, mentions three, that's what I call on the handout, Kenny's trio, three um, elements of happiness. 
uh, welfare, which is <coughs> he defines as the satisfaction of our animal needs, um, quite objective, measurable aspects such as um, health, life expectancy, um, and so on. And to this he adds a second component, contentment, which is the, if you like, the inner dimension of welfare. Um, the individual's feeling of being free from anxiety or distress, uh, and more positively a feeling that life's going pretty well. Um, what leads you to tick the smiley box as opposed to the gloomy box, you know, these current, I think, rather spurious surveys on emotional happiness. Are you somewhat miserable, quite miserable, uh, about average, somewhat happy, very happy? Um, and, and that again, but I think in principle it's pretty much uh, um, clear whether someone is or isn't miserable, even in the case of animals. I mean, we can't perhaps ask a dog about its subjective contentment but if it's lying in front of the fire, um, uh, well-fed, warm, secure, then uh, it's fairly clear, I think, that, that the dog is contented in the same sort of way as a human being would be. And then finally, in Kenny's trio, dignity, which is very much more a human, especially human characteristic, largely to do with the exercise of choice. I mean, slaves can no doubt be contented and uh, healthy, but I think we shouldn't count them as happy, fully happy in human terms, if they lack the dignity of being able to make their own decisions. For example, about who to marry, or uh, where to live, or um, what occupation to pursue, and so on. So there's not, uh, I think there's a lot more to be, that could be said about these basic ingredients of a flourishing life. Um, flourishing is, of course, a biological term. Etymologically, it's flowering. Um, so for a tomato plant or a tomato plant to flourish is for, it, pretty clear, it's for it to have vigorous shoots and leaves and eventually to put forward succulent fruit. Um, but what are the fruits of human life? Well, all the th things I've mentioned so far are important and necessary. You might call them preconditions. But I think when we want to look deeper into human happiness, we, we get on to rather more substantive elements, elements that go way beyond the biological and scientifically measurable components I've so far mentioned. And these elements, as I say in 2b there, have to do with human achievement, with human virtue, and with, tran well, what we might call the dimension of the transcendent, or what I shall argue is the dimension of the transcendent. They have to do respectively with the fine the good and the meaningful. They're concerned in turn with the developments of talents, with character development, development of talents, that's achievement, character development, that's virtue, and lastly, something rather more mysterious and complicated, which for the moment I'll just label to do with meaningfulness and transcendence, and we'll come back to that later. So let me take achievement first, since it's relatively uncontroversial. Um, in the island described in Tennyson's poem, The Lotus Eaters, which m many of you may know, take, takes its cue from Homer's Odyssey, um, they Odysseus and his companions arrive at a very pleasant island. It's idyllic, supremely relaxed and comfortable, um, very pleasant, rather like the planet described in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, or at least a portion of that planet. You know, this is a planet that stopped rotating, so some parts of it are 
hellishly cold, others a permanent desert and terribly hot, but there's a kind of temperate zone where it's always four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, you know, time for tea and cucumber sandwiches. Um, the stock market's just closed and everyone is feel feeling good. Um, so the lotus eaters in, in this island are contented enough, uh, but it slowly dawns on Odysseus, or, or Ulysses in his Latin name, that there's something rather troubling about these inhabitants. They never do anything. They just sit around all day eating the lotus leaf, which perhaps was the ancient Greek equivalent of smoking marijuana or uh, drinking a series of gin and tonics. Um, they, um, so the moral drawn by uh, Homer and by Tennyson in his poem is that mere contentment isn't enough, that somehow we need to be stretched to lead a happy and worthwhile life. Um, like it or not, we humans cannot be truly happy if we allow our talents to atrophy. Um, and um, again, this may not be very comfortable. Odysseus's companions had to be dragged kicking and, and screaming back to the ship because they wanted to stay on this comfortable island. But as the story of the talents in, in Matthew's Gospel shows, um, talents are for use, not to be buried in the ground. Um, we need to achieve excellence to be happy as human beings. Of course, excellence can take many forms, artistic, musical, intellectual, physical. Everyone has different gifts and not everyone is expected to, to achieve the same level. Um, but some degree, I, I claim, some degree of achievement is necessary for human happiness. And achievement doesn't simply drop in our laps. It has to be striven for as the Dutch 17th century, Dutch-Jewish 17th century philosopher Spinoza said, uh, omnia preclara sunt difficilia, all fine things are hard, are difficult. Um, this again, I think, is whether we like it or not, a necessary fact about the human condition. So happiness requires achievement, that's the first claim. But, but though it's necessary, it's not sufficient. It's not enough of itself. Something more is needed, and this brings me to the second dimension I want to talk about, rather more controversial perhaps, namely virtue. Um, rather old-fashioned term, but it's to do with moral character, moral character development. Um, consider the case of someone who has considerable success and achievement, but uses their talents in an utterly vicious way. I would argue this can't constitute human happiness. Suppose um, someone exercises their leadership and organizational skills running a concentration camp. Could he be, could such a person be happy, go home in the evening um, and have jolly evenings with his family? Well, I think not because the grisly daytime activities will sooner or later blunt his human sensibilities and this will eventually spill over into all aspects of that person's life. Take a perhaps rather more interesting case than the con concentration camp. The concentration camp guard is one of these somewhat artificial cases beloved of philosophers. You know, can, can the concentration camp guard be happy? Uh, but a rather more interesting case is someone, I think, like, like Don Giovanni. Let's take the Don Giovanni of Mozart's opera, who exercises his charm and charisma and intelligence in a way that perhaps is glamorous and exciting and gratifies his ego but at the cost of riding roughshod over the feelings of others. Can he be happy? Well, you might say, well, of course he can. Surely uh, 
he sings a triumphant songs about how splendid his life is. Viva le femmine, viva il buon vino. He sings in that uh, mm -hmm. aria, hooray for, hurrah for um, wine, women, and song. Um, maybe his life's vicious, someone might object, but that doesn't show he's not happy. Well, I think one can't deny that the vicious person may have considerable enjoyment. Much of their life may be fun, may be diverting. Diverting is an interesting word, actually, which Don Giovanni uses. Mi voglio divertir, he says to Leporello. I want to engage in some diversions, have some fun. Um, but happiness, I think, is different from that. It's rather, as Aristotle insisted, uh, it's to be assessed over a whole lifetime. And it's not just a matter of pleasurable episodes. Um, and if you think of the life as a whole, then I don't think this is a particularly religious point or anything. Um, the Scottish atheist philosopher David Hume in the 18th century insisted that vice can't make you happy in the long run. Um, now, I think there's a crude interpretation of that and a more interesting, a more subtle interpretation. On the crude interpretation, being vicious won't make you happy because sooner or later you'll get caught and, and have to pay for it. And of course, Don Giovanni does. He eventually is taken down to hell at the end of the opera. But, I, I mean, I think that if there's an afterlife, of course, that something like that may be true. But um, I think even if it, if it is true, uh, and I don't think philosophers, qua philosophers, can pronounce on that, but even if it is true, it's somewhat too simplistic, I think. Um, it misses the point. In, in the opera, when the... Giovanni is taken down to hell and the other players sweep onto the stage and sing a rather smug little concluding aria. That's the way all sinners end. Um, there, there's somehow it's a bit too easy an ending to show what's wrong with his life. Um, what's wrong with his life, I think, is shown by in, in some of the music earlier in the opera, in the kind of haunting, sinister, somber underlay that's given to a lot of his earlier arias, which I think tells us that even before he's taken down to hell, his life is still somehow out of jo joint. He's a psychologically damaged figure, a person who partly senses, partly senses, even in the midst of his diversions, that something's gone wrong, that he has misused his human capacities for vulnerability, for openness, for sensitivity, for responsiveness to others. All these have been swept away in exchange for ego gratification. And although he may furiously insist that he is happy, that he's diverting himself, um, he can't escape this fact. He cannot, I think, be truly happy. Rather like the lotus eaters, he may, or, or Odysseus's companions, who would, he may kick and scream against it. He may want to insist that he's quite happy as he is. But human beings, whether they like it or not, have an inbuilt drive towards the good, I suggest, despite the flaws inherent in all of us. And if that drive is blunted, then however much they may achieve, however successful they may be in uh, outward terms, they can't be at peace. Um, so virtue is an inescapable ingredient, I think, of human happiness. Our human nature can't flourish when certain capacities which are developed in conjunction with the moral virtues are stunted. So human happiness is inevitably fragmented and damaged when it's pursued in a way that's cut off from the pursuit of good, of the good. So, I've so far argued that there are two necessary conditions for happiness. First, achievement. Second, virtue. And I now come to the third and most difficult of all, uh, transcendence. Um, 
In, actually, in case you're looking at the handout, you think the talk's going rather slowly and there's a vast amount still to come. Let me reassure you that uh, um, the size of the bits on the handout doesn't reflect the length of time of the, of the lecture as a whole. Um, now, let's go on now to 3A, because this comes, starts to bring us nearer to this dimension, I think, of meaning and transcendence. Um, Part of it, I think, has to do with the fragility of human life. Um, we are aware, to begin with, of our mortality as none of the animals, other animals, quite are. Um, as the atheist philosopher Anthony Grayling has observed, uh, we did a series on happiness for uh, the Reading Public Lecture Series a couple of years ago, and uh, he was a speaker alongside myself, and in his talk he pointed out that the ration of life for a human being, even if you make it to a decent old age, is about a thousand months. Now, put like that, it doesn't seem very long to achieve, I mean, 70, you know, three score years and ten, we're kind of used to that figure, but the figure of a thousand months is, is a bit more daunting, I think. But even without dwelling on, on that sombre fact of all our mortality, I think we, can't, we cannot but be aware of the fragility and contingency. It's not just that we are dust and will return to the dust, as the book of Genesis says, though that is true. Unlike some of Genesis, it's literally true. We are formed of dust. We are formed of stardust, uh, as is sometimes pointed out, the elements from... Um, exploded stars are the elements out of which we are formed. Um, but, um, and nor is it just a matter of accidents, the thousand shocks that flesh is heir to, as Hamlet says. Um, though these things are important, philosophers, I think, are often very bad at acknowledging these facts about contingency and fragility. They often write as if human beings are these grand autonomous beings who can determine the conditions for their fulfillment. Uh, it's really the fantasy of the Enlightenment, um, the fantasy of autonomy. Um, I wouldn't deny its allure, but I think ultimately it is a fantasy. Um, in the words of the title of a recent book by Alistair McIntyre, we are, human beings are dependent rational animals. Rational animal, of course, was Aristotle's definition. McIntyre adds that important qualifier, dependent. Um, we need to recognize our, independent, uh, our dependence. Um, we're not self-creating or self-sustaining. Um, the psalmist famously puts, puts this by saying, it is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. Um, I think that's a powerful way of putting the point, but it can be put in secular terms. Uh, irrespective of whether or not you believe in God, we have to acknowledge that our very existence from day to day, from moment to moment, is dependent on a vast nexus of circumstances, causes, chains of causality which we don't fully understand and which we did not ourselves create. And this contingency, this fragility, means that human happiness is intrinsically vulnerable. That of obviously affects my, the first thing I mentioned, achievement, uh, but it also affects morality too. I mean, being a good and decent person does not insulate you against all the accidents and shocks and fragilities of life. Um, the Stoics like to think that the virtuous person was kind of immune. Uh, that sort of uh, uh, capsule of virtue would, would protect you. But I think that is optimistic, um, that even the most virtuous person can be subject to what Bernard Williams calls moral luck, the kind of arbitrariness of events which can undermine um, people's lives in a very uh, systematic way. Luck, accident, fortune, gives way 
fortune, good or ill, gives way to that sense of arbitrariness that nothing ultimately matters very much. And this in turn d generates certain kind of sense of futility or absurdity. Absurdity, the special theme of the 20th century existentialist philosophers like Sartre, Jean-Paul Sartre, and Albert Camus. Um, you, I'm sure you know uh, Camus' reflections on the myth of Sisyphus, um, a fascinating little essay written in the 1940s where he talks about Sisyphus rolling the stone uphill only to have it crashing down again and then endlessly having to repeat it. Um, Camus stands for this sort of pointlessness of life, the struggle that never seems to be sure of success, in fact, is doomed to failure. Um, he, Sisyphus is a kind of defiant thinker who is, above all, won't, uh, won't give up, won't abandon his lust for life, refuses to be do docile or accepting. He is described by Camus as the true hero of the absurd. And in the last sentence of that uh, essay, Camus makes a striking claim about Sisyphus as he turns for the umpteenth time and sees the boulder crashing down the hill again. And he's got to go and push it up again. Uh, he says, Il faut imaginer Sisyphe heureux. We must imagine Sisyphus as being happy. Well, perhaps, <laughs> perhaps we must, but um, I'm somewhat sceptical. I think to, if we def to take that sort of defiant heroism as our model, we're embracing a very elitist model of the human condition. Uh, I think most of us, all too conscious of our frailties and uh, weakness, would be very quickly daunted by such a prospect of unending toil with, without any success. Um, yet, of course, that bleak picture is precisely the one Camus is presenting in the book. And the book opens with a chilling pronouncement where he says, there's only one serious philosophical problem, the problem of suicide. Um, I, I mean, in a way, the absurd universe that he leaves us with is one where ultimately there is no meaning. Um, well, so does this third dimension of happiness I'm now talking about, the, the, the need for meaning, lead us to embrace something more religious? Um, well, not, I think, if you mean a very crude view of religion that it sort of makes everything better. Um, I mean, that may be part of it, um, the idea of, of, of the resurrection and the afterlife. I'm not in any way dissing that notion, but I'm saying it's not the whole story. Um, and indeed, if you look at the world's religions, they put, particularly of course in Christianity, but it's there in, in other great religions too, there's a great emphasis not so much on happiness, but on suffering, on human suffering. And indeed in Christianity, of course, it's absolutely central with the symbol of the cross. The triumph of goodness is a, is a subtle and complicated notion, but it certainly doesn't mean there's a lot of easy answers, I think. So, um, um, when Paul, in his letters, talks about nothing separating us from the love of God, he's speaking from a tradition which is extremely acutely aware, as one can see this throughout the Hebrew Bible, of terrible sufferings which have come upon uh, good people. So it's certainly not a glib or easy set of answers. It's rather something more about resilience and faith, which is not a magical, everything will be okay, but rather uh, something which generates virtues which may make us able to endure virtues like the famous theological virtues of faith, hope, and love. Uh, I won't, um, in this paper, say very much more about suffering, but I think there is a long tradition in, in, in philosophy and in religion which sees suffering as having certain, despite its horrors, uh, 
and one's not in any way minimizing those, but nonetheless as having certain redemptive powers. Um, and that, I think, is important for any proper conception of human happiness and fulfillment. Um, the thought really is that um, well, the basic idea could be put as follows that we're here not just to improve the quality of our life, important though that is, but to come to terms with the interior dimension of which many writers from St. Augustine onwards have focused. The task, to put it bluntly, is to orient ourselves towards the good and to grow in knowledge and love of the good. And that's not just a matter of everything working out okay or being happy in a, in a superficial sense. Um, and I do think the disciplines of spirituality, uh, which have traditionally included reading, chanting, meditation, prayer, fasting, and so on, uh, these are of interest here. They're clearly on quite a different wavelength from um, rationalistic and scientific solutions. Um, I'm not saying these traditions of spirituality should be immune from criticism, far from it. Like any human activity, they can become corrupt uh, and need careful critical scrutiny. But nonetheless, at their best, I think these forms of life are ways of developing all our human resources, not just for fulfilling our welfare needs, but for ethical sensibility, emotional depth, psychological and moral growth, tranquility, integrity, and ultimately perhaps what has been in the tradition called blessedness. And that's not an easy path, but it's a path, I think, which will resonate with many people, whether they take a religious view or not, of ultimate reality. Um, if you just look at that quotation from George Eliot in 3C, she talks a bit about the redemptive power of suffering. Let us be thankful that our sorrow lives in us in a, as an indestructible force, only changing its form as forces do and passing from pain into sympathy, the one poor word which includes all our best insight and our best love. For it's at such periods that the sense of our lives having visible and invisible relations beyond any of which either our present or prospective self is the center grows like a muscle that we're obliged to lean on and exert. Complicated but very resonant sentence, I think, that. Uh, George Eliot herself was agnostic about the, nat the nature of these visible and invisible relations. But I think one can see something there which is moving towards um, a more religious perspective or something like it. Now let me sum up so far I've argued about these basic biological and uh, other preconditions for happiness that we can objectively measure. But beyond that, I've suggested that to be happy, a human life needs in the first place to be one of genuine achievement, developing our capacities. Second, needs to be oriented towards the good, because a life cut off from the good cannot achieve human happiness ultimately. And thirdly, a sense of meaning a sense of the courage to endure in the face of our being inherently weak and dependent creatures. And this brings us to the need for, spiritual dim for a spiritual dimension in our lives as we recognize our finitude and embark on the search for the transcendent. Now, in, in just the final fairly brief section, I just want to say a quick word about uh, transcendence. Um, in more, yes. This is partly expressed uh, in a nice 
phrase of the, by the French 17th century philosopher Blaise Pascal, who said in his collection of thoughts, which he was hoping to turn into a book, uh, but um, forestalled by his premature death, uh, he said, Lom pas lom, man transcends man, man transcends himself. What does that mean? I think part of what it means is that beyond any given set of limits or parameters, we will always look for more. Human beings will never be satisfied with having their life defined for them as these conditions. They will always reach beyond. There's a restlessness about our human nature, the restlessness of, what, of which uh, Augustine uh, famously spoke. For an animal, you can give it the ideal conditions and then it will flourish. For human beings, there will always be that urge to reach beyond, to somehow transcend them. And that, of course, in a way, is the religious impulse, the yearning for the transcendent. Like, could we just block this and accept that we just are the way we are? This is the planet, this is the way it is. Why can't we just accept contingency? Well, the British philosopher Bernard Williams, one of the great 20th century ethicists, uh, thought or argued that we could. This is 4A. He basically is saying we just got to accept the contingency of human life and not keep trying to yearn beyond it. Uh, I'll just, if you just look at that quotation, this is from his book, Philosophy is a Human, uh, his essay, Philosophy is a Humanistic Discipline. Um, we can accept that this outlook is ours just because the history uh, that both made us and made the outlook, ju sorry, just because of the history that has both made us and made the outlook. We are no less contingently formed than the outlook is and the formation is significantly the same. If we really understand this, we can be free of our illusion that it's our job as rational agents to search for a system which would be the best for an from an absolute point of view. Uh, it's a bit complicated, that, but the basic idea is we shouldn't try and search for some God's eye perspective. We've just evolved in a certain way as a certain sort of creature, biological creature. We've evolved and developed to have a certain outlook, and so just accept it, in a way, just get on with it. Uh, that's his argument. But I don't think it really does allay the disquiet that arises from this confrontation with, with our ultimate contingency. Um, and the nature of that worry can be seen if you look back to an earlier, more confident age when people did believe in a transcendent source of value, an eternal source of value. There the idea was that life was meaningful if we could make it fit with certain ultimate values. You if there was a harmony between us and the cosmos, if you like. You see that in Stoicism, you see it in many ancient philosophies, and you certainly see it in Christianity, where the good for man is to be, bring ourselves into harmony with the divine, into conformity with it. Uh, so in Platonism, in Stoicism, and in Christianity, there is that idea of harmony. If you give that up, you get to something very much more pessimistic, I think. And um, if you look at 4b, um, you can see a kind of pessimism in Bernard Williams, whom I quoted in 4a, when he talks about us having to, um, he talks about a tragic view of human existence. A view, this is the view he has. He's rejected the transcendent. And it's the view that, quote, refuses to present human beings as in harmony with their world, and which has no room for a world that, if it were understood well enough, could instruct us to be in harmony with it. Um, there, one's kind of abandoning any hope of a teleological framework, any hope of a purposive framework that could give meaning and value to our lives. We'd be just accepting in the phrase of uh, a title by an interesting recent book by Simon Critchley, 
that things merely are. Uh, things just are that way. Um, we'd be closing the door on the possibility of a supernatural or transcendent basis for meaning and harmonious living. Now, let me just say that Friedrich Nietzsche, a very influential um, uh, philosopher in these matters of meaning and value, thought that human beings could somehow get round this by a magnificent act of will that human beings of an exalted enough type could just create their own meaning and value. Um, and I think, myself, that's a confused fantasy. I cannot create meaning and value for myself just by willing it. Nietzsche talked about this act of will. I can't make cardboard nutritious by willing to eat it. Um, however grandly and exaltedly I will it. Um, it. Indeed, that when you think about it, that puts the cart before the horse. Uh, you can choose things only because they're independently valuable. And it makes sense to choose them because they're already, as it were, meaningful or valuable. Um, now, what emerges from Williams, Bernard Williams, and his acceptance, his rejection of transcendence, his acceptance of... Uh, contingency is a sort of resigned acquiescence, I think. We just rest content with the way things are. But I think there's a tension there in that even it, as you're saying be content with how, it, how things merely are, that merely carries a sort of implicit yearning for something more. You can't get away from that restlessness of the human spirit. It's, it's longing to reach forward beyond the finite conditions of our existence. And if you just look at for uh, C there, uh, this is Thomas Nagel, uh, a famous American philosopher who, uh, who has a fascinating co collection, Mortal Questions, um, in which there's an essay on the absurd. And he says this, that given the transcendental step, that that's the step of the reaching forward, is natural to humans, can we avoid absurdity by refusing to take that step and remaining entirely within our sublunar lives, our ordinary earthly lives? Well, says Nagel, we can't refuse consciously, for to do that we had to be aware of the viewpoint we were refusing to adopt. The only way to avoid the relevant self-consciousness would be nev either never to attain it or to forget it, neither of which could be achieved by the will. So to make our home within the entirely contingent, closed cosmos and pretend that we're comfortable seems a violation of our human nature. Kind of willed quietism, if you like. A willed complacency which we don't really feel. Another strategy which some modern philosophers have tried is the strategy of irony saying, oh, it doesn't all really very matter very much, kind of shrugging of the shoulders, uh, explored by Richard Rorty for a time. Uh, and a third option would be the defiance that I mentioned in Camus, uh, the, of Sisyphus. Yet that is really at a severe cost. Um, and indeed, just as you're def being defiant and saying, somehow I can make it all right, um, you're in the position, I think, which is eloquently summed up in that 4D, the quotation from uh, Simon Critchley. At the moment of saying, God is dead, therefore I am, it's entirely unclear in what the I am consist, consists. It's a mere leaf blown by the wind, a vapor, an ember, a bubble. Uh, at the moment of the ego's assertion, in swelling up to fill a universe without God is also the point at which it shrinks to insignificance. So, just to conclude, how can we have confidence in the face of the seeming absurdity and futility and utter contingency of human existence? Well, the religious answer, which I won't explore this afternoon, but I perhaps said enough, uh, 
to indicate that its key is some kind of hope. Hope makes sense for the believer because it has an object, something to hope for. Whereas if you just say that things merely are, then, or that we're just here, or we're just the universe is just there, as Bertrand Russell once put it. There was a famous debate between the atheist Bertrand Russell and um, the theist Frederick Copleston, when Copleston challenged him and said, are you saying the universe is entirely contingent and gratuitous? And Bertrand Russell replied, I should prefer to say the universe is just there, um, which is a kind of rather nice way of expressing that sort of brute contingency. Um, but if it is just there, in Russell's phrase, then it's not really very clear what the hope could be about. Because looked at from a cosmic perspective, our window on existence is tiny. We know that the planet will be extinguished eventually, uh, in, indeed in cosmic time, a fairly short time. And um, it's hard to see against that backdrop of contingency and ultimate destruction, how there can be any ultimate value. Um, but on the traditional religious picture, by contrast, there is faith in an objective and ultimate source of goodness, to come back to what I was saying in, at the beginning. So the script, so far from being just randomly assembled, will be resonant with meaning though it may take hard work to discern it, I certainly don't think objective, transcendent meaning gives us a set of easy answers. Um, but there will, in principle, be hope, faith, that there is a t an objective teleological framework, that's to say a framework of purpose, and therefore that there will be a pattern for the good life which is discoverable. No guaranteed success but we will have the hope of a non-contingent structure that grounds our human existence and underlies our moral aspirations. And without that, it seems to me, the threat of contingency and futility and absurdity, which I've been talking about, will be hard to eradicate. Some of our activities, of course, will be satisfying, and perhaps that's all we can or should hope for. But unless human beings find some way of anaesthetizing their transcendent aspirations, there'll always be the fear that all the frantic endeavors of those imbecile worms of the earth, as Pascal called us, cannot succeed in making our lives as a whole ultimately meaningful. And in the absence of meaningfulness, as I've been arguing this afternoon, we will lack one of the most basic ingredients for a good and happy life for humankind. Thank you very much. Thank you.